Ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to speak about Islam and its impact on mathematics, for it is indeed a glorious history. The prominent historian De Vaux said, the Muslims were indisputably the founders of plane and spherical geometry. He, of course, forgot to mention algebra. Islamic art is prized for its beauty, its complexity, its harmony, and its intricacy. There are many good reasons for exploring geometry and Islamic art in schools. They provide a genuine cross-curricular focus, offering scope for coordinated work in mathematics and the art. Also, there's a fantastic opportunity to show that we value contributions from our host culture, both in terms of artistic expression and mathematical knowledge. Now, I'm conscious of the fact that we may have BSID inspectors here, so I'm going to be politically correct by talking about learning objectives first. <laughs> the first is very straightforward to me, is to look at the Islamic contribution to mathematics. Second, it's about inspiration. Inspire math through the, through the study of Islamic geometric designs. The next word we have heard often to have fun with, in this case, with Islamic geometric designs. And the last one, of course, is to create works of art. Now, again, I'm conscious of the SIB inspectors, so I'm going to carry out a formative assessment. And you'll be delighted to know that it's differentiated. So if you're gifted and talented, you'll just get the question. If you're of average ability, you will get a choice. And those who can't will get the answer. <laughs> So I've got five questions, ladies and gentlemen. After which Muslim mathematician is the term algorithm named? Yes, we've got some gifted and talented people here. And the answer is al -Khawarizmi. Okay, here's the second one. Which Muslim mathematician is regarded as the father of optics? I think some, I heard, it, I heard the correct name there. For those who didn't hear it, thank you. Okay, the third one. What Muslim polymath is regarded as the first aviator, 9th century? Ibn Furnas. He, he had many, many tries, many broken bones, but he was the first one to fly. Aha, this is the tough one. The last one is the easiest. Which Muslim mathematician, philosopher, musician, and physicist has been described as one of the 12 great minds of history? I don't hear any gifted and talented. Okay, here's the choices. And the answer is Al-Kindi. Thank you very much. Now, the last one is about European scientists, okay, mathematicians. So, which Italian mathematician played a major role in promoting the use of algebraic numbers in Europe. There are four choices, Galileo, and the other three are Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci, Giano, uh, Leonardo Fibonacci, and Leonardo DiCaprio, Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> the famous actor, sorry. And the answer, ladies and gentlemen, is Fibonacci. Okay. Muslims see the importance of seeking knowledge from the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. Seek knowledge even if you have to go to China. Today, there is hardly a single entity, be it business, industry, education, or architecture, without the use of the Arabic numerals, the decimal point, the sign and the cosine, or the compass, amongst others, which are all Islamic inventions. I'd like to quickly go through seven Islamic math geniuses. We heard this name earlier on, considered the greatest of all, math, of all mathematicians. Um, he gave us the names algebra and algorithm. His genius came from being fascinated by numbers, and his originality and depth is very clear in his works. al Karaji. He was the first 
It was the first to use mathematical induction. So what he said was is that first statement in a series is true, then so are the subsequent ones. Right? A very simple example of it is this one here. He proved that one cube plus two cube, oh by the way, what's that equal to? Nine. Nine, thank you. Okay, I often get 12 is the answer. Because one cube is one, not three. Okay. One cube plus two cube is nine, equals one plus two squared. If this is correct, then this is correct as well. Then one cube plus two cube plus three cube equals one plus two plus three squared. Just check it out, what is the total? 36, 36. 36. The next one, Omar al-Khayyam, is a mathematician in his own right. But typically people tend to know him for his poetry, the Rubaiyat. And for those of you who are from this part of the world, you would have heard the late famous singer, Um Khaltoun, who sang many of Omar Khayyam's poetry. And I'm going to read you one of those. Okay. This is particularly significant today in the world of text messages and Twitters. Once the word is out, you cannot pull it back. And this is what his poetry is about. The moving finger writes, and having written, moves on. Nor all thy piety nor wit shall lure, lure it back to cancel half a line, nor all thy tears wash out a word of it. Be careful what you put out on email. This is the gentleman that Dago was talking about, the contribution to trigonometry uh, is a separate discipline, the work on spherical trigonometry. Of course, for mathematicians, he is famous for the sine law for the plane triangles. A over sine A equals B over sine B equals C over sine C. <coughs> Ibn Haytham, we heard this name earlier on. He made the link, link between algebra and geometry. More critically, his influence on the European mathematicians Descartes and Newton were profound. Al-Farasi did some fantastic one optical problems, but he also worked on number theory. And he came up with something called amicable numbers, or what are called friendly numbers. So for example, 220 and 284 are friendly numbers because the proper divisor of 220 equals 284. And the proper divisor of 284, the sum of those becomes 220. So these are friendly numbers as a result of that. For example, 220, the divisors are 1, 2, 4, 5, 10, 11, 20, 22, 44, 55, and 110. If you add all those numbers up, you get 284, and vice versa. The last on my list, and by no means last within, within Islamic mathematicians, is Thabit bin Qura, greatest Muslim math geometer, and he did many mathematical di discoveries, including things we would have learned in school, integral calculus. But he also provided a new proof for the Pythagoras theorem. Just want to give you a preamble to this slide. <clears throat> As a student at university and at school, I was tremendously frustrated because Growing up in the West, there was no reference made to work of Muslim scientists or mathematicians. Here's a very good example. The Astrolab is the GPS. Uh, it's the original GPS. And it was developed in the ninth, it was worked on in the ninth century. Uh, became very popular and brought to Europe in the 12th century. Now, if you read literature, even today, it'll say, It'll make reference to Astrolab nine centuries before Hijri, two centuries BC. And then suddenly they'll talk about it in the 16th, 17th century as if the glory of Islam was the Dark Ages. It was the Golden Age of Islam, but there's no mention made of that. Fortunately, and I urge you to read 1001 Inventions, because many of the writers are Westerners and it is done scientifically using valid and reliable sources. I've got four slides to tell you the frustrations that one goes through. What is taught and what should be taught? So for example, books will tell you typically that it was the French 
mathematician Francois Vieta, who worked on algebraic symbols, and he wrote a book about it in 1591. What should be taught is that it's the Muslim mathematicians who invented algebra, and by the ninth century, the concepts of using letters for unknown variables was well known to them. But nobody ever makes any mention of this. What is taught? That in 1614, John Napier invented logarithms and log tables. Well, it was the Islamic mathematicians that did that, and they were common in the 13th century. What is taught? That the decimal fractions in mathematics were first developed by a Dutchman in 1589, whereas it was Al-Kashi's Al book that was the stimulus for decimals, and it was written in the early part of the 15th century. And here's the last one, that the concept of numbers less than zero, in other words, negative numbers, was not known until 1549, and uh, what should be taught that it was introduced 400 years earlier, uh, and it was well known to Muslim mathematicians. What I want to do is to bring the world of beauty into the mathematics that we teach our kids. And this is a typical Arabic geometric design, and if you see the features of it, there is symmetry, there is repetition, and there is variation. Symmetry, repetition, and variation. And this is a common aspect of all, almost all Islamic geometry. It is the division of the regular circle into parts that gives rise to the geometry. And what you find is that Islamic art increases an appreciation of the understanding of mathematical geometry. What is fascinating for me is that all you need for this is a ruler and a compass. That's all. So, the circle is the point of origin. If you draw a circle, then within that is contained the origins of the other polygons. You can create a triangle out of it, a square out of it, you can create an octagon out of it. All right. So the eight-pointed star, which you see very frequently, as I walked into this building, I was fascinated by the number of places where there was Islamic art, geometric designs there. And I wonder how many times we stop with our children, with our students, and just find out whether they really grasp it, whether they've internalized that we live in a part of the world which is infused with mathematics and geometry and art. So you can take a circle, and make a square out of it, make an eight-sided figure out of it, and make, come up with some of the most fantastic designs that you will see anywhere. You can take a seven overlapping circles. In the first one, you've got one circle with the two more, you've got three circles. You can add four more circles to it and you get seven circles out of it. That's all you need, a ruler and a compass. And out of that, you get the most beautiful hexagonal design, and you can extend it further into triangles of different shapes. And then, of course, you then allow the kids to use their imagination to paint it, to create a geometric design. This is fascinating exercise your kids will love. This is a triangle grid. If you look at the first one without the dark blue lines on it, it's just a triangular grid. And from this, kids can create triangles, they can create diamonds, they can create hexagons. And I certainly realized this morning that in the middle design, you actually have the logo of Mitsubishi there. Yeah. Simple geometric design, right? Uh, it's something I'll never forget. And so there's, and now of course the coloring comes in. If you look at five overlapping circles, because people often, often think that Islamic design just has straight lines but that's not true at all. You've got one circle in the center and four around it. And with the help of that, you can create the most exciting geometry. <coughs> These are patterns you can create with diagonal grid. So you've got diamonds there, you've got triangles there, you've got squares there, you've got octagons there, 
the sky is the limit. So the question then arises, where can these things be used in the classroom to support learning? And I'll give some actual examples of students' work shortly. So in the primary, the students have many opportunities because they can recognize the shapes we've been talking about, the circle, the triangle, the square, the hexagon, the octagon. They can create 2D designs. I showed you examples of it. The key thing that you need to show them is the lines of symmetry. You can show them reflective lines of symmetry. So this is where one is a mirror image of the other. Or they can then look at rotational symmetry where you have one shape and then you rotate it and then you create other shapes out of it. Okay? These are all things that are done at the early years and the primary years. You can go to the upper primary and the middle school and students can study symmetry patterns to produce tessellations. Now tessellations are simply patterns that, uh, that are made by repeating a regular polygon. So if you repeat triangles, if you repeat squares, the design you get out of that is called tessellations. And I want to specifically mention something that my colleague Dr. Samia mentioned to me. At the Amman Baccalaureate School in Jordan, they used to have three to six weeks of interdisciplinary projects where they mixed architecture, mathematics, geometry, Islamic design, nature, music, the whole place came absolutely alive. It was just the, the range of learnings that, that took place in an interdisciplinary fashion was absolutely mind-blowing. And then in the end, I do want to bring a little bit of my chemistry to tell you that you can have, for your very t gifted and talented, or your high school, you can take the geometric designs we have seen to see how molecular crystals are based on geometric designs. I want to thank my colleague, uh, Ms. Delise Scotto, the principal of American Academy, Ms. Her. This was the work done by her students. Some of the work was by grade two students, some was grade eight students. And I was just absolutely flabbergasted. If you look at the very first one on the top, this is as good as you would see anywhere. I'm tempted to go and sell this print or display it in, the, in our offices or in the schools. It has already been displayed. But it is remarkable what the kids came up with. This is nothing that was given to them except for those grids and to create repeating designs after that. The mathematics they learned behind it, the shapes they learned, the, the work of art they created. The lesson plan for this is in one of the later slides, and I'll provide that to you. One of the things that people forget is how much geometry there is in nature. And whenever you're teaching shapes, bring nature into it, bring examples of it. Let the kids open their eyes to this. So here's an example of family of five geometry in Islamic art. The shapes are up there, but of course below them are the ones that are abundant in nature. For example, the starfish. An apple, somebody will always say to me, my God, what's wrong with you? How can apple be five, five star geometry? But if you slice it into half, you will see that the core has five star geometry in it. Let the kids find this out for themselves. Right? So there are fantastic opportunities in nature where there are examples of five star, a uh, family of five geometry. In the same way, there are many examples of family of six geometry. The top ones represent Islamic art, and the bottom ones are the beehive is a classic example, the snowflakes. As a chemist, the structure of, of ice is fundamentally important. In Canada, the Inuit have up to a thousand different names for snowflakes because no two snowflakes are the same, but the geometry is the same. They all are six faces, and that's the beauty of it. Right? So explore these things with your children. We live in a world of technology, and uh, if you let your kids lose on this, they will just amaze you with, with what they come up with. Um, this is a free a workshop. It's a hands-on workshop that shows how Islamic artists approach their craft. 
Um, and it can be done using the, there's a reference for that there, but it can be used doing the, the geometer's sketchpad, which is a software, and it allows students to play with the software to create the most intricate geometric patterns. Here are some examples of it. This is about a tessellation. It starts with a square, and just look at what the kids can create out of that. Now, I want to pay attention to the cube for a minute, because I'm going to be using it for the, for the secondary kids later on. You can actually prepare a cube which looks three-dimensional from the two-dimensional pattern. So uh, I'll just look at that. But what you've got to do is let your kids lose. Let, this is independent learning. This is where they learn geometry at its finest and have a lot of fun doing it at the same time. What they learn out of this is that they understand the math behind it. Now, for this particular two or three slides, I want to thank my colleague from Jumeirah Baccalaureate School. Keith Spencer is the head of mathematics. And I was just fascinated as I was observing it in his class with what he was doing with something called the formulator Tarsia. If you just type the word Tarsia, this program will come up. It is a free software for math teachers to create jigsaw puzzles and Islamic designs. And it has a built-in equation editor. So you can, you can use every single topic in mathematics to review and create design out of it. So here's, here's what happens. So it gives you a template. Okay? It's a hexagon. And in the template, you can, study, you can put in what you want to study. You can choose. So here's for the indices. I chose the example of indices. And if you look very carefully, there is uh, 3 times 2, 3 times a times a times 3. And the answer below is 9a squared. So you have to arrange these triangles in such a way that the question in one matches the answer to the other. So this is a fantastic way of practicing indices. Now, you as a teacher, you can get this out of it. So it's just not one hexagon, it's multiples. You give this to the students and you ask them to cut into triangles. Then you let them loose. And what they come up with is they work in groups. They match the answers that they have to get correct from you. If they can't match the answers, they can't do the next. And then they create Islamic designs out of it. This exercise was done just before the national day. And the group at the bottom was trying to match some of the colors of the national flag to the geometric designs that have created. But you can review and have fun with any mathematical topic, whether it's algebra, whether it is uh, numbers, whether it's, you know, whatever the case may be, indices, you can do all of those using this particular idea. So here's the lesson plan for the one that was used at the American Academy. In the second top half of the column, there are three tasks. The first one is to research something about Muslim mathematicians. The second part was to do the geometric designs using the grids. And the third one culminated in the product that you saw, and a piece of art. Now, I want to push this a little bit and show you 3D applications of it. There's some fantastic mathematics involved. So here I have six spheres touching each other, touching one in the center at the bottom. The dark, the dark blue one has got six with one in the center, so they've got seven spheres touching each other very closely. The three yellow ones in the holes, and then six on top. And you immediately realize that if I was packing this, it's just tennis balls, things of tennis balls in a box. You can never occupy 100% of the box because there are empty spaces between the circles, between the spheres. You can now repeat this in three dimension, okay? And so if you do that, what you get is a pattern like that. You're repeating it horizontally and vertically. And so you get a pattern called ABA. You're just repeating it. The second layer is the duplicate of the fourth layer and the sixth layer and the eighth layer. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the structure of aluminum. You can do the mathematics of it and figure out that about 74, less than three-fourths of the space is occupied. Okay. I'll tell you why this is significant in a minute. Here's a square. How do I make a cube out of it? I draw another square. 
and I combine the lines. So I've got a cube out of it. Now think of eight atoms, four on the top corner and four on the bottom corner. That's a simple cube. I can put an atom in the center. Now remember, these atoms are actually touching each other. I separated it so you can see it clearly, but like the earlier one, these are touching each other. Now you can create, you can calculate the volume of this cube because you know the radius of, of that sphere. You know the radius of the sphere, so you know the volume of the sphere. Okay? And lengthwise, because those spheres are touching each other, you can actually calculate the length. And you can find out that this occupies 52% of the volume. And this is the structure of sodium. And sodium is a soft metal I can cut with a knife because of, its, of, of the amount of empty space there. You can push this really hard by taking it to the structure of sodium chloride, rock salt. Okay. Now, of course, you've got two ions. You've got the sodium ion and the chloride ion. It gets very complicated. Okay. It gets very complicated. And yet, there is a symmetry behind it. You have a sodium ion surrounded by six chloride ions. You've got chloride ions surrounded by six. And you get this fantastic geometry which is a cube, but if you look very carefully within it, you've got hexagonal shape at the same time. Okay. Can our students do this? Absolutely. Okay. It is a matter of using two-dimensional geometry, stretching it to three-dimensional geometry, and let their imagination go wild. And it's as simple as that. So here is a rubric for the assignment that was done on 3D shape. The project on Islamic math and art, which had the three components to it are listed. And then there was the rubric for it. And the students were supposed to do their own self-evaluation. And then they were supposed to explain to justify to the teacher what that evaluation was. And they were given a final assessment based on that. This is probably the most important slide I can share with you because this is some fantastic resources. The very first one is from the Metropolitan Museum of Art and it's got activities for the students. This uh, PowerPoint will be available and so people will be able to download it. The second one is a really very good one, Mathematics, Geometry and the Arts resource. The third one is Islamic art and culture, a resource for teachers. The next one was absolutely fantastic, the connection between Islamic art and mathematics. The next one, using technology to investigate mathematics in Islamic art. This is a reference for the formulator Tarsia, a book of curiosities of the sciences and the marvels of the eyes. This is about Islamic sciences, and on and on. So I'm going to bring it back to full circle. The objectives, we must celebrate the, the fantastic work of Muslim mathematicians in everything we do in math. It will inspire mathematics through Islamic geometry to have fun and to create works of art. Now I put the last statement there, LO, LO, LO. Anybody know what it stands for? The first one is learning objectives. Hello, I've given the answer with the second one. Learning outcomes is the third one. The second one is learning opportunities. That's what a good lesson should be. It should provide the objectives to the kids, the opportunities for them to work in groups, to work in alone, to, to think creatively. And then at the end of it, you can look at the learning outcomes associated with it. So this is the mantra in our schools. You walk in there and sometimes the teachers will tell you, hello, 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 and uh, they are on target. They're working at what they Okay, um, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. We will post this. Um, the more I have looked at what's available, the more I'm, I'm amazed at how much it can be integrated into the teaching of mathematics and Islamic art. And I encourage you, I urge all of you to exploit this to the fullest because it will give them such a better understanding of the culture that they live in and the pride with which things are done and how much 
the culture of the Muslim world has contributed to the development of mathematics and science in the world. Thank you very much.